The college campus was buzzing with the kind of energy that you can only find in a place overflowing with young dreams and ambitions. That's where I met Ethan. We were both gunning for the same scholarship, the kind that not only covered tuition, but also bragging rights. It was big, it was what every nerd in our batch was after. And boy, did we clash over it. Seriously, Ethan? You think you can outdo me on the thesis? Dream on. I'd scoff at him across the library, my eyes barely lifting from my laptop. He'd just grin, that annoyingly confident smirk that drove me nuts. Ava, I'll see you at the finish line. Better bring your A-game. We were both stubborn as hell, each convinced we were the rightful winner of that grant. Our debates got so heated, sometimes I thought we'd end up setting the lecture halls on fire with our arguments. Your argument on the economic theories is so half-baked, I could serve it for breakfast, Ethan once told me during a mock debate. The class had erupted in laughter, and I could feel my cheeks burning, not just from embarrassment, but from the raging fire, to prove him wrong. Oh, please, your so-called innovative perspective is just recycled trash. Heard it all before, Ethan, I shot back, not missing a beat. It wasn't just about the scholarship, it was a battle of wits, pride, and, unbeknownst to us at the time, a budding attraction that neither of us wanted to admit. Our rivalry was the talk of the campus. We were always at each other's throats, challenging one another to do better, be smarter. But as the final decision on the grant neared, something shifted between us. Maybe it was the late-night study sessions that ended in shared coffee breaks, or the way we'd inadvertently learn more about each other's lives beyond the books. You know, for a smartass, you're not that bad. I found myself saying one night as we left the library together, the campus quiet around us. Ethan chuckled, shoving his hands in his pockets. Look who's talking. I've seen you help the freshmen with their assignments. Not the heartless competitor everyone thinks. It was strange, this new dynamic. Our banter softened, tinged with a reluctant respect that slowly melted into something warmer. When the day of the scholarship announcement came, we sat next to each other, an unspoken truce, between us. May the best man, or woman, win, Ethan whispered, his hand brushing mine. I remember the rush of emotions when they called my name. But what stood out more was the genuine smile on Ethan's face. Guess you were the best man after all, he said, his laughter mingling with mine. From that day forward, our relationship took a new turn. We were still competitive, but it was different. We challenged each other to be better, supported each other's dreams. Our arguments turned into discussions, our banter into inside jokes. And somewhere along the line, we stopped being rivals and started being something more. Moving in together was the easiest decision we'd ever made. It felt like the natural next step, a testament to how far we'd come from those two hot-headed students who couldn't stand to be in the same room unless it was to argue over academic theories. Our friends were shocked. You too? Really? They'd ask, disbelief written all over their faces. Yeah, really? We'd say, exchanging looks that spoke volumes of the journey we'd been on. From rivals to roommates to, dare I say, soulmates. Living with Ethan was like being in our little bubble. But bubbles are delicate, and ours was no exception, especially when it came to dealing with his folks. Martha and John were as traditional as they come, and our choice to live together without the whole marriage shebang didn't sit well with them. Not at all. It was like a broken record every time we saw them. You're living in sin, Ava. It's not right. Martha would start, her tone laced with disappointment and a touch of scorn. She was a pro at guilt trips, making sure to sprinkle in stories of her own purity. John and I didn't even kiss until we were married. Can you imagine? I tried to keep my cool, respect was important to me, but boy, was it hard. Martha, times have changed. People don't wait for marriage to be together anymore. It's normal. Ethan stood by me, bless him, but it was like talking to a wall with them. John would chime in, voice heavy with this sense of betrayed values. We raised you better, Ethan. You're supposed to be a decent man, not swayed by, by this. This, that's what I was to them. Never Ava, always this, 
as if I were some bad influence instead of the person their son loved. Ethan tried to bridge the gap. Mom, Dad, I love Ava. We're happy. Can't you just be happy for us? But nope, it was like everything he said just bounced off them. Martha, with her knack for drama, would clutch at her pearls, literally. Happy? How can we be happy when you're living in sin? It's not right, Ethan. You know it's not. The worst part? Ethan was caught in the crossfire. His folks made it seem like I had him under some spell. You've changed, son. This isn't you. John would say, shaking his head like Ethan was some puppet gone rogue. And me? I was trying not to lose it. I respected their beliefs, sure, but the constant judgment was a drag. I told Ethan as much. I get where they're coming from, but I'm not the enemy here. We're just living our lives. I know, he'd sigh, looking like he was carrying the world on his shoulders. It's just, they're my parents. I wish they could see how good we are together. In the end, it felt like we were stuck in this loop. Us trying to live our lives, them seeing it as some personal affront. It was exhausting, dealing with the endless lectures and the not-so-subtle digs at our life choices. But what could we do? They were his parents, and no amount of reasoning seemed to make a dent. So we kept on, living our sinful life, hoping one day they'd come around. Or at least, stop making every dinner feel like a trial where we were always found guilty. Just when I thought Martha and John's nagging couldn't get any worse, they hit us with a new plan. You both need guidance, Martha announced one evening, her tone more determined than ever. We've arranged for you to meet with Father Mike. He'll set you straight. Ethan and I exchanged a look. The kind that said, are you kidding me? Without needing words. Mom, really? We don't need a priest to tell us how to live our lives. Ethan tried to reason, his patience wearing thin. But Martha was on a mission, and when Martha got going, there was no stopping her. It's not up for discussion, Ethan. You're going, and that's final. It's for your own good. So there we were, a few days later, sitting uncomfortably in Father Mike's office, a cozy little room filled with religious books and those cliché inspirational posters. Father Mike was a kind-looking man, but the situation was just absurd. Now, I understand there's some concern about your living arrangements. Father Mike began, peering over his glasses at us. I bit my tongue, really wanting to say something snarky, but managed to keep it civil. We're fine, really. It's just that Ethan's parents are a bit, traditional. Father Mike nodded, as if this wasn't the first time he'd been dragged into a family squabble. Marriage is a sacred union, but so is love and respect for one another. Are you two committed to each other? Ethan took my hand, giving it a reassuring squeeze. Yes, we are. Completely. The priest smiled, then turned to some of his books, probably looking for some wise quote to throw at us. But before he could get into it, Ethan cut in. Look, father, we appreciate what you're trying to do, but we're happy. Isn't that what matters? Father Mike looked at us, then, after a long pause, he closed his book. You're right. Happiness and commitment are what truly matter. Maybe it's not me who needs to guide you, but perhaps I can help your parents understand your choices. That meeting didn't magically fix everything, but it was a start. Or so we thought. Martha and John thanked Father Mike for his time, but seemed to ignore the whole happiness and commitment are what truly matter part. Instead, they focused on the sacred union bit. See? Even Father Mike agrees. You two need to get married, Martha insisted, completely missing the point. Ethan and I just looked at each other, the reality of the situation sinking in. No matter what we did, it seemed like his parents would never be satisfied. It was like banging our heads against a brick wall. Let's just get married and get it over with, I muttered to Ethan on our way home, half joking, but also half desperate for some peace. Ethan sighed, the weight of the world on his shoulders. I'll do anything if it means they'll finally leave us alone. Little did we know, that decision to give in would open a whole new can of worms. 
but at that moment, all we wanted was a break from the constant pressure. If a wedding was what it took, then so be it. The wedding was something straight out of a fairy tale, or so I thought. I pulled out all the stops to make sure it was an event that would make Martha and John happy, given their traditional views. The church was decked out in flowers, the music was solemn yet uplifting, and I was dressed in a gown that was the very definition of elegance. Even Martha, who could rival a statue when it came to showing emotions, shed a few tears during the ceremony. But, of course, there was a catch. My friends, who'd been my rock through this whole ordeal, came dressed to kill. They looked amazing, but apparently, their style was a bit too much for Martha. Did you see how they're dressed? She whispered to me, right in the middle of the reception. It's a wedding, not a nightclub. I could feel my cheeks burning, not sure if it was from anger or embarrassment. Martha, they're my friends. They're here to celebrate with us. Can we just focus on that? She clucked her tongue, shaking her head like I'd just failed the world's easiest test. I'm just saying. A little modesty wouldn't hurt. After we caved and got hitched, Martha and John must have thought they snagged an all-access pass to our place. No kidding, they started popping by every single day. If you ever needed a live demo of what too much looks like, this was it. One Saturday morning, there's a knock that could wake the dead. I'm talking 6 a.m., and these two are at our door, like they're about to miss a flight. Ethan, barely awake, trudges to the door, and there they are, bright and chipper. Good morning, we thought we'd spend the day together. Martha chirps, pushing past Ethan, like it's the most normal thing in the world. I'm in the kitchen, drowning my sorrows in coffee, when John starts critiquing my choice of breakfast. You know, a hearty breakfast is important. This, is this even food? He's eyeballing my cereal like it's from another planet. Eggs and bacon were fine for you, right? I mutter under my breath, not in the mood to start my day off with a lecture on nutritional values. Then, Martha, bless her heart, decides to give me a rundown on cleanliness. Ava, dear, have you considered organizing your cupboards a bit more? And maybe using some coasters? Water rings on the table are such an eyesore. I'm biting my tongue so hard it's a miracle I still have it. Ethan sees me clenching my fists and jumps in. Mom, Dad, you know, we really appreciate your visits, but maybe we could do with a bit of space? You'd think he'd ask them to move to Mars by the looks on their faces. Space? But we're family. We just want to be close to you too, John says, utterly baffled by the concept of personal boundaries. Martha's on the verge of tears now, playing the guilt card like a pro. Do you not want us here? After everything we've done for you. It's like walking on eggshells. You try to set some ground rules, and suddenly you're the villain in their soap opera. I hit my breaking point on a Thursday evening, the kind that started with the same old surprise visit from Martha and John and ended with me locking myself in the bathroom, just to get a minute of peace. This has got to stop, I muttered to Ethan as we lay in bed, the moon casting a soft glow through our window. Your folks are driving me nuts. It's like we're living in a reality show, but there's no escaping the cameras. Ethan, looking as worn out as I felt, let out a long sigh. I know, babe. It's getting to me too. What do we do, though? They're my parents. Uh-huh, but this is our home. We can't keep living like this, I shot back, my frustration bubbling over. We need space. Real space. Maybe, maybe we should move. Like, actually move. Ethan propped himself up on one elbow, eyeing me like I'd just suggested we join the circus. Move? Like, pack up everything and just go? Why not? I was half serious, half desperate. Your parents can't drop by if we're not here, right? The idea seemed radical, even to me, but the more we talked about it, the less crazy it seemed. We started to imagine a life where dinner wasn't interrupted by unannounced visits or our weekends weren't planned around avoiding his parents. Okay, let's say we do this. Where would we go? Ethan asked, the gears in his head turning. I don't know, 
somewhere close enough to keep our jobs but far enough that it's not just a hop, skip, and a jump for your mom and dad, I suggested, warming to the idea. The decision felt right, almost liberating. We started house hunting online, looking for a place that could be our fresh start, far away from unannounced morning visits and constant criticism. It wasn't long before we found it, a cozy little house in a neighboring city. It was perfect, and the best part? I could buy it with the money I'd inherited from my grandmother. This wasn't just a new house, it was a statement. My money, my rules. A fresh slate on our terms. They're going to flip, Ethan said, dreading the conversation. Mom's going to think we're abandoning them. Maybe, I conceded, but we're not doing this to hurt them. We're doing it for us, for our sanity. They'll just have to understand. The conversation went as well as we'd feared. There were tears, accusations, and a lot of guilt being thrown around. But we stood our ground, knowing this was the right move for us. We did it, I said to Ethan as we signed the papers, the weight of the world lifting off our shoulders. The move was hectic, filled with boxes and goodbyes, and the promise of peace. We kept our jobs, commuting a bit further than before, but every mile was worth it for the tranquility that greeted us at the end of the day. Our new life in the neighboring city was everything we'd hoped for. We fell back into our old rhythms, enjoying the quiet and the privacy we'd missed so much. The in-laws? We kept in touch through the internet, a safe buffer that allowed us to control the narrative and the visits. It was a compromise, but a necessary one. Our calls were polite, the conversations brief and infrequent, but it was enough to keep the peace. Just when Ethan and I thought we'd found our slice of peace in the new city, life decided to throw us a curveball. It was a quiet Sunday morning, the kind where you just want to laze around and enjoy the calm. That's when the doorbell rang, shattering the silence. Who could that be? I murmured, not expecting anyone. We weren't exactly social butterflies, especially not here, not yet. Ethan shrugged, equally puzzled, and strolled over to the door. When he opened it, his puzzled look morphed into outright disbelief. There, on our doorstep, stood Martha and John, each with a suitcase bigger than the last time they'd criticized our breakfast choices. Surprise! Martha exclaimed, her smile wide enough to split her face. John just nodded, his usual taciturn self, but even he seemed to wear a small grin. What are? How did you? Why? Ethan's eloquence was gone, replaced by staccato confusion. We've decided to move in. Martha declared as if announcing they'd won the lottery. It's time we all lived together, as a family should. My mind raced. This had to be a joke, a very bad one. Move in? With us? I echoed, hoping I'd misunderstood. Yes, dear. We sold our house. We're here to stay. Martha said, pushing past Ethan, making herself at home as if she hadn't just dropped a bombshell on our doorstep. Ethan and I exchanged a look of sheer panic. You can't just decide to move in with us. I managed to say, finally finding his voice. Martha and John weren't just shocked at our refusal, they were outraged. You can't possibly expect us to leave. We're family, and this house, it's as much our son's as it is yours, Martha asserted, her voice a mix of indignation and disbelief. John, usually more reserved, joined in with a surprising fierceness. Exactly. Ethan's our son, and you're living here, thanks to him. You're just a freeloader, making decisions that aren't yours to make. I could barely contain my laughter, not because it was funny, but because of the sheer audacity. Ethan's face was a picture of shock, turning to me with wide eyes as if to say, are they serious? Hold on a minute, I said, still chuckling as I went to retrieve a folder from our home office. I flipped it open to a very important document, the deed to the house. I made sure they could see it clearly. See this? This house was bought with the money I inherited from my grandmother. I am the sole owner. So, actually, it's entirely up to me who lives here. And you, I pointed squarely at Martha and John, are not staying. Martha's mouth opened and closed like a fish out of water, while John's face turned a shade of red I hadn't seen before. 
Ethan stepped beside me, a proud yet stern look on his face. You heard her. Ava bought this house. Not me, not us, Ava. And we've decided. together that moving in uninvited isn't an option. After I dropped the bombshell about owning the house, Martha tried to play her final card, all but declaring squatters' rights on account of Ethan living with me. He's our son. We have every right to be wherever he is. We're family, and that means we stay together," she announced, puffing up like a peacock. I couldn't help it, a laugh escaped me, before I could clamp it down. This was it, the moment I'd been keeping close to the chest for just such an occasion. Well, here's a fun fact for you, I said, the smile on my face growing wider by the second. Ethan and I? We're not actually married. Not legally, anyway. The wedding was for show, to get you off our backs about living in sin. The look on Martha and John's faces? Priceless. Like they'd swallowed lemons whole. What do you mean not married? That whole ceremony. Martha's voice trailed off, her brain unable to compute. Yep, a ceremony without the paperwork. So, technically, you're not my in-laws. And this, I gestured around, is my house. Ethan's just living with me. My rules, my decision who stays and who goes. John's face went through fifty shades of red, anger, and embarrassment battling for dominance. You can't just, that's not how things are done. Ethan stepped up then, his tone steady, but firm. Mom, Dad, I love Ava. And I'm tired, so tired, of the way you've treated us, her especially. We did what we had to, to live our lives on our terms. It's time you went home. Martha, not one to go down without a fight, turned her frustration into a weapon. Ethan, you listen here. You're going to leave this, this woman, and come with us. She's tricked you, manipulated you. But Ethan was unmovable, a rock in the storm. No, Mom. I'm staying. With Ava. I love her, even if we're not married by your standards. It's my life, our life, and it's time you respected that. The standoff in our living room was tense, a silent battle of wills. But in the end, Martha and John had no choice but to leave, their departure a mix of rage and disbelief. As the door closed behind them, the silence that settled was profound, a mix of relief and the sobering realization of the bridge we'd just burned. Ethan and I looked at each other, a single thought between us, no matter what, we were in this together. After Martha and John huffed out of our place, tails between their legs, Word got around through the grapevine that their big move was all a bluff. They never sold their house, it was just a ploy to muscle in on us, 
thinking they could pull one over and make themselves comfy at our expense. Can you believe that? The nerve of some people. But hey, here we are, still in our own little slice of heaven, shaking our heads at the whole mess. Can you imagine if they actually had sold their house? I said to Ethan one evening, the two of us sprawled out on the couch, enjoying the peace. <laughs>
depths and quiet. Ethan chuckled, a deep, hearty sound that filled the room. That would have been a disaster. Good thing they're too attached to their precious home to actually go through with it. We got to talking about the future, just the two of us, figuring out where we go from here. So, what do you think about making it official, you know, after you, we, if we're lucky enough to have a kid? Ethan asked, a bit hesitantly. I thought about it, turning the idea over in my mind. I guess. Might make things simpler, paperwork-wise. But you know, I don't need a piece of paper to tell me I'm yours. Yes, I feel the same. It's just us, Ava. Always has been, always will be. Screw anyone who thinks they can dictate how we live our lives, Ethan said, his voice firm with conviction. It was settled then. We'd cross that bridge when we came to it, but for now, we were content. Just Ava and Ethan against the world, no legal documents needed to validate what we had. Our love was the real deal, stamps in the passports or not. And as the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, that feeling of us against the world only grew stronger. We were a team, and nothing, not even sneaky in-laws with their bizarre schemes, could tear us apart. As for Martha and John, well, they kept their distance. Maybe they learned their lesson, maybe not. But one thing was for sure, Ethan and I were untouchable, living our lives on our own terms, in our own time. The future looked bright from where we were sitting, a blank canvas ready to be filled with love, laughter, and maybe, just maybe, the pitter-patter of tiny feet. But until then, we were just fine enjoying the peace, thankful for every quiet moment we had together in our little sanctuary.